today. And I want to thank all of you for joining this session, um, which we've titled Coping with COVID, Building Resilience for 2021. We have uh, two fantastic presenters slash panelists. Um, we've got a lot of questions from folks submitted ahead of time, and I believe that we have a possible case for presentation. Before I introduce the presenters, I do want to remind everyone that we are offering free continuing medical education or continuing education credits. Go to eads.com and today's code is 70 more 70 morning Oscar Roomba Echo. And that will expire in 24 hours. So please go to eads the next day and complete your evaluation and sign in. So I'll go to Stephanie first. Um, please unmute yourself and let us know who you are and where you come from. Hi, my name is Stephanie Orwick. I'm the Assistant Director for the Center for Student Wellness and Counseling Services at Neomed. Thanks. And Joe? Good afternoon. I'm uh, Dr. Joe Zarconi. I'm uh, Neomed's Chairman for Internal Medicine and also currently serving in the role of uh, University Medical Director for COVID-19 operations, uh, which is, I think, the role that got me invited here. Sure is. Um, thank you both. Just to remind folks how this works is we're going to have a short presentation from Stephanie and Joe um, trying to answer some of the questions that had, or maybe some of the themes that had come up in the questions submitted ahead of time. But please, throughout the session, put your questions into the chat box when we get to the question and answer portion. I will try to call on you so you can unmute and ask a question so that we can get a little bit of engagement. Um, it's nice to see so many cameras on. We you know, really do enjoy, even in these very large sessions, seeing people's faces. But for now, I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie. Okay, let me share the screen. Hopefully. All right. Um, I kind of want to start this out, though, um, by saying um, that Joe and I have this is our first pandemic and as it is for most people. And so just being mindful that we're basing a lot of our information on past research and kind of what we know about other traumas and not necessarily the trauma of a pandemic. So um, if we were to do this presentation in about two years, the information might change. So that's our little caveat for starting this. Um, so real quick objectives, just really I want to give you some concrete things that you can use um, with yourself, with your clients, with your patients, um, based on the model of post-traumatic growth. Um, Dr. Zarconi talks a little bit more about resilience too, and we'll kind of talk about what the, how they're the same and separate. Um, and again, hopefully just leaving you guys with some strategies to take within your workplace um, in healthcare. So I think the first thing to kind of start off with is the trauma definition by our friends over at the DSM-5. Um, and really, I want to focus on how this relates to COVID. Obviously, the exposure to actual or threatened death or serious injury. So that kind of fits with the symptoms of what this virus is doing. Um, the subcategories are directly experiencing the traumatic event. So that would be you being the patient sick um, or witnessing in person the event that occurred to others. Um, so this could be as a provider, as a family member, a friend. Um, and that kind of talks on to the next part of like learning that it occurred to a friend um, or a close relative or something like that. Um, they talked about this little, the definition of being violent or accidental. So again, this is, there is no um, DSM definition of how this applies to pandemic um, situations with viruses. But when you think about the accidental, I don't think anybody's purposely going out and getting COVID. Um, people aren't trying to spread this. It's quite the contrary that people are being extra cautious, trying not to get sick. So that kind of really uh, fits this little criteria. And the one that's important for a lot of us as providers is that experiencing the repeated extreme exposure to aversive details of the traumatic event. Um, so I think about people in this meeting that are physicians and talking to patients and knowing the symptoms um, or mental health providers talking about the anxiety um, and the symptoms of that. Um, so we, and then there's the first responders. So the, the frontline workers in ambulance or even intake um, in hospital systems that are seeing what exactly this virus is doing to people. Um, there is a little note in it that criterion A4 does not apply to exposure through electronic media. Um, and I, there is some research that says that's not true. Um, we even think about the really old research about in the 1990s of the video game thing, right? That like people that played excessive violent video games had a less than threshold to um, violence in general. Um, and so I imagine that DSM-6 or DSM-5 revised 
um, might adjust this a little bit, especially when we are a world that is driven a lot of times by social media and electronic media. So um, we'll see how that changes, even though that says it's not a thing. I, I firmly believe that's going to be a thing. So if anybody wants me to be on the panel for the next DSM-6, let them know that I'm available. So, um, so the reason I bring up the trauma is just so that we know what that idea kind of looks like and where we're kind of basing the post-traumatic growth from and coming from that clinical mindset. Um, so simple definition is going beyond previous levels of functioning. So we, you know, you're gonna hear the names Tadishi and Calhoun and um, throughout this presentation, they're the big, the big names when it talks about post-traumatic growth. And even though O'Leary did this back um, a while ago, they really started co coining the, the term post-traumatic growth in like the 1990s at the University of Carolina. And what they found out is that there's an adverse re um, event and, or trauma and people either are negatively impacted. So there's that impairment that might be the PTSD um, standard. Uh, a lot of people, most people recover and that's our standard resilience that they're able to overcome this. But they notice that there's this, this group of people um, that were able to grow and they kind of identified growth by, by five separate areas. So increased appreciation for life, um, improved relationships with others, identifying new possibilities due to the trauma, uh, personal strengths so being able to recognize maybe some strengths they didn't have before and this spiritual change component, um, which can mean a lot of different things, not just religion. Um, and so they, they want to separate this from resiliency. And I know down the slide deck, we have, we talk a little bit more about resilience. So resilience is really th that they talk about that a lot of that comes from people's personal disposition. Um, people can be resilient without a trauma. So they are able to kind of uh, survive and thrive no matter what. Um, and, but with post-traumatic growth, it's, it's necessary to have the trauma. It's necessary to kind of reach that level where there could be a possible impairment. Um, the other thing is too, that they noticed during, um, for personality changes. So kind of talking about resiliency, people tend to have the same personality type. Um, a lot of research has shown that people that experience this post-traumatic growth can shift, um, a little bit on that Myers-Briggs based on the, the experience that happened. So. Um, that's a very condensed, watered down uh, definition of what the post-traumatic growth is. Um, so kind of moving forward, we wanted to give you guys some kind of tangibles to take away. And um, before we get to those, I just want to say they're very simple. Um, and I think a lot of people think in order to be growing and thriving past this trauma that we need to be doing extraordinary things um, and not recognizing that just existing is, is pretty extraordinary, right? Um, and so maybe honing in on these um, tools we, for ourselves and for our patients and clients, we can push them to that growth and not just the resilience, um, but know that most of us are, we're already checking the box on the resilience if you're not already doing the, the post-traumatic growth yourself. So um, I'm probably not going to blow your mind with any new material, but hopefully this will kind of maybe reaffirm the practices that you're already doing. So there's a Thrive model, and you'll see um, how it spells out, and this kind of is followed in a lot of different areas of research about the things you kind of want to focus on with post-traumatic growth. So the first one is taking stock, um, and this is just really that present tense, mindful um, viewpoint of looking at what you do have and making sure those basic needs are met and not looking at what you don't have, what you lost, all that forward, backward stuff. Um, so Maslow's hierarchy of needs, we're at the very bottom of this. Um, and if you focus on those things, um, we notice that it does, when you talk about the neuroscience of it, it makes those pathways, those neuro pathways, a little bit smoother and you're gonna get more positive emotions or you're gonna be able to pull up those um, safety feeling ideas faster than the negative ones. So if you constantly are thinking about what you don't have, um, your mind's going to go there, you're going to experience um, more distress, and you're going to be able to stay in distress a little bit longer. So really making sure those needs are met, and then when you get them, focusing that, that those are pretty positive things. Um, so you really want to strengthen those neural pathways by focusing on the things that you do have, and if you don't have them, make sure that we're seeking those out right now. Um, part two of this is then being aware, again, of the connection and emotion. So connection, our brains are made for connecting with people, right? Like our synapses feel when we're around people. Um, we think about Louis Consola. He did the, the neuroscience of psychotherapy. He talked about that our brains actually heal themselves from trauma 
um, when there is connection. And so hello therapy or talking to your physician, um, just being able to, to bounce those ideas off of that are gonna kind of heal the, those broken brains. Um, emotion, so post-traumatic growth and then there's resilience. And then there's also kind of this like grief model that goes along with it. And so taking stock of your emotion is really just acknowledging what you feel. Like if you're ticked off, it is okay to be ticked off right now. Like nobody's saying to, to do the sunny disposition of this. Um, if you're disappointed, sad, all those things, I think a lot of times um, our automatic response is that we want to shift to those positive emotions. But it's important to say like, I'm sad. Why am I sad? Um, I'm scared. Why am I scared? Well, I'm annoyed. Why am I annoyed? And being able to kind of see what's behind those emotions. And that kind of moves us through that grief model a little bit longer. Last, but, you know, again, a kind of a simple one, what can you do and what did you learn? So focusing on those tangibles instead of the, the unknowns, um, even making this presentation, right? I could talk about all the things that could shift or what we don't know. Um, but instead, we're going to focus on what we do know and how that's applied to trauma in our brains previously. And, and focus on what we do, what we think is happening right now. So that's the T and the Thrive model. The next one is hope. Um, and Dr. Zarconi is gonna talk a little bit more about this, but um, there's indefinite research about how a hopeful attitude um, helps with resiliency, with post-traumatic growth, with, with healing, with even um, outcomes with physical health. Um, and so they talk about the power of just having a hopeful attitude. Um, but sometimes it's hard to be hopeful, right? Like when we don't know if we don't have super great imaginations and stuff like that. Um, and that's where we kind of focus on finding that inspiration and then also finding support. So um, being hopeful that me doesn't mean that you don't care about what's happening right now or that you're like blindly optimistic. Like I just want it to be like July, 2021. I'm hopeful that that's gonna be a time when we can like be around people again. It's midsummer time, right? Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm denying that there is suffering going on right now or that there's restriction right now. So um, again, kind of going with the inspiration, first time that we're having a whole lot of information on pandemics, but that doesn't mean that we can't look um, for survival stories. Uh, a lot of Viktor Frankl with the Holocaust, um, they talked about Michael J. Fox's uh, biography with the development of his Parkinson's. So different things like that, that um, and what that does, again, is just reinstates those ideas in our brains that like hope is available, um, survivorship is possible, and that that growth is going to happen. And again, it just makes us more cognitive of those ideas. Support for us and for others. Um, so if somebody is having a hard time uh, identifying those hopefuls or those positive outcomes, you can be that guidepost um, as a provider. And it can be as simple as saying like, hey, there's this really good book. You should, you know, if you, you want inspiration, look at that. Or uh, identifying those models and stuff like that. Um, or if you self are, are struggling, make sure that you're reaching out to other people too. Like you don't have to be the burden for all of this. Another way to kind of focus on that hope is that future focus or, you know, the, the miracle question, right? You go to bed at night and a miracle happens and you wake up tomorrow, what looks different? Um, that's where you can really identify what those, you know, those concrete things that you're looking forward to. Uh, the miracle question is also good, um, as many mental health and uh, healthcare providers probably know that like a lot of times we're the only thing standing in the way of our own problems. So some of those hopes for the future can actually be happening now. Um, and so that's a good way too, and that increases that self-efficacy if I have something and I'm able to do that. So doing that with your patients and clients. Reauthoring, um, I think is really, really important and something, um, you know, I don't wanna blame the media for everything, um, but really it's all about semantics. So when you're talking about this difficult situation, well, what are the positives, right? Like there, there are people who are coming up with fast cures. I just saw a thing that like llamas might be the answer to COVID, which is amazing. I love llamas, love them even more now. Um, so it's just, it's how you phrase things. So if you're like, oh, there was this terrible period um, where I wasn't allowed to go see my friends and there was lots of fear and stuff like that, like that's gonna start triggering some of those emotions as it should. Um, maybe revise, you know, some of the, those trauma responses, or you can say, you know, yeah, I wasn't able to go to work, but it was the first time that I got to work from home. And that's normally not something I would do. Um, or I had a really scaled down Thanksgiving and like, guess what? I actually really liked it, not making food for a thousand people. So it's just, it's identifying those things and reframing it in that, that way. Um, you are the author of your story. I'm not going to tell you how to author it, um, but you can make your story a little bit more warm and fuzzy if you choose to. This is that kind of goes into that Carol Dweck growth mindset of 
focusing on what you have accomplished and what you are doing and focusing on those actions instead of that gap of what's being as the goal. So even though that's typically growth mindsets applied to like academics um, and very measurable things like that, this can be applied in the situation of survivorship of um, I've been kicking butt at certain things, right? You all have been kicking butt at certain things. Let's not look at the things that we didn't get to accomplish this year. Instead, look at the fact that like, we just survived this stinking pandemic and like now we made it to the holiday season and we're on an echo right now. Like that's really, really cool. Um, and again, those pathways and the emotions and hormones associated with that and even the development of the brain is gonna shift. That's the reoccurring. Um, identifying change. Uh, so some of us are really like meta and aware and, and know how we've changed um, for the positive. So again, we really wanna kind of have that semantic focus on the positive things. So like maybe don't notice on like how much fast food takeout you've had and said that you supported local businesses. So kind of shifting that idea of, of what you've done differently. Um, there is a tool for this that is wonderful if some of you or someone is struggling. Um, it's just the, the well-being post-traumatic changes questionnaire. So it's an 18 item self-report measure um, and how you proceed. And so this is just like a little snippet of it. Um, and so it helps you measure like what things are going better. And the idea with someone um, and what they've done with research is that they repeat it. And there are certain areas that tend to grow. Um, and then for the people that were kind of maybe struggling or maybe having more PTSD symptoms when they were able to see their own assessments, it was kind of able to help them challenge those cognitions um, and rewrite kind of some of those, those stories that they've experienced too. And so they noticed a decrease in PTSD symptoms. A lot of combat veterans um, studied in this one. Um, but it's by giving them the idea, and again, it's maybe planting that neural pathway of like, oh, I do respect myself. Valuing change. So that's part two. This is so, and you know, being really proud of myself for supporting local businesses and ordering takeout a million times over the past year. Like being proud of myself for that, um, and thankful that I get to try those um, new ideas. So. Um, this kind of goes a little bit when you talk about that grief model of that acceptance stage, right? Like, I don't think anybody, nobody wants this, right? Um, and we don't have to be happy, and especially with grief, like, it's not that we're, like, super pumped that this is happening. The acceptance stage is that we, we had this, and we have grown because of it, and this is what has changed. And so really, that's that gratitude, and that's kind of that last component of the post-traumatic um, growth that they really, really sort of important that people despite how everything works, found the benefits and were thankful for some of the outcomes for that. And actually older than the well-being assessment was the PGTI. Um, and again, this is just where people could, could monitor um, what has changed in their life. And then the more they repeated this study, um, they were able to see that people grew, right? Like so the people that were meeting the, gro the post-traumatic growth um, noticed their numbers went higher and higher with that. So last is expressing change in action. So us humans like seeing things done. Uh, we like to, to walk the walk, not just talk the talk. Um, and so this is where you act as evidence. So it's good to feel warm and fuzzy. We want our, our patients and clients to feel, feel warm and fuzzy, um, but we know those neural pathways and those synapses and everything's gonna align a little bit better is when they're acting as if. Um, so this is where we're kind of, you know, challenging that automatic nervous system about what stress is and then we act differently, it's, it's going to impact that boss of legal response. Um, but it's important that the action is important to you. Um, and so this is maybe where you want to be careful of checking in with your clients and patients. So um, there, there's, they had an example of like, there's two people, a crisis happens, one signs up for uh, college classes, one drops out. Um, those both can be really post-traumatic growth. They can be very valuable. One is they're driven to do a higher power and get more education. The other one is that they realize that education isn't important for the things that they value the most. And so they're gonna pull out of school and focus on things that are more important to them than the education. So let, let your patients and clients define that change value for themselves um, and just be open-minded that it can look a little bit different for everybody. Uh, the Fuji Sawa, and um, I'm flattering that, um, did a brain scan because I know there are quite a, question, a few questions about brain scans. Um, we have a lot of brain scans for PTSD um, patients. We do not have a lot of brain scans for just people that just experience trauma and don't necessarily have symptoms. So I want to kind of have a caveat with that. Um, but what he did find, though, um, is that the left central executive network, so I got to look at this. Um, so they had higher, the people that had the higher scores on the post-traumatic growth and in, um, inventory 
had higher activity in this cortex. And what they were able to measure is that they had higher, um, better memory skills, and then they had better social functioning. So that part of the brain lit up a little bit more with that social functioning. So it is changing your brain. Having this post-traumatic growth um, does positively activate those part of those veins. Um, even more important then too, why maybe we want to do some intervention. So um, another example, it's not a brain scan, but it's a development thing. So I stand girl super hardcore over Bruce Perry. I always will, always have. Um, if you guys want to join a fan club with me, let me know. We'll get it started. But here is kind of an example of a developmental brain of a 14-year-old now. So Bruce Perry, like in a nutshell, he was a lot of neurodevelopment um, with traumatized youth, not so much adults. So a lot of his stuff was on youth, but I think this is important in case um, we work with children. Um, and within it, so on the green side, obviously, is a normal brain with the development. Um, on the pink and red and all the ideas, a, a youth that experienced a trauma. And so he didn't describe the trauma on this one, but we can say, hey, maybe this is someone who lost their parents um, to COVID and had to go put in the foster system or live with an extended relative. Um, and we know that the more intervention they got, you can see that their brain does go back to that, that development. So there still might be some, some lack of development due to the trauma. But with intervention, this Christopher 14 year old male was able to kind of recover a little bit of that development. So even more of a reason um, for us to interact with people and, and kind of get on that, that early intervention if they are suffering from those symptoms. Um, unfortunately, I don't have anything like this, I said, for like male or for adults. Um, we just have a lot of use for, for the development. But um, again, based on what Fuji Sawa said and stuff too, there's a, there's a lot of hints that there is a lot of brain growth with this as well. Um, helpful truths, um, just so again, kind of to take away and to, to wrap up is um, we are not alone in this. You know, we are all experiencing this together. But again, knowing that and supporting that idea is going to really help those connection parts of our brain. Trauma is normal, right? Like most of us are going to experience a trauma based on those definitions at some time in our life. Um, weird that we're all experiencing a trauma together. So, you know, it's that idea of like we're all in the same storm, but we're not necessarily in the same boat. Um, so making sure you can take care of people if your boat's in a good shape. Um, and growth is a journey. Um, that's going to be the other part of this. Like whatever research they're doing now on us for this pandemic, um, wonder what that's going to look like in five years and 10 years and stuff. And so um, I'm hopeful that it's going to be good research and we're going to keep seeing even better things because we are such a resilient species. Um, but just remember that for yourselves and for your clients too. Like it, it might take a while before things start looking good, but you know, based on what we know, a lot of people are going to look good. So. There's some of my resources. I have tons more if you guys need anything. And now I'm going to switch over to Dr. Zarkani. Thank you, Stephanie. Uh, I do, I'm not sure I'm going to have control of these slides, but we'll see in a second. I have a couple, just a couple of, um, first of all, uh, again, just want to say how uh, great it is to uh, be with all of you, and uh, it's interesting to, to reflect on this connection that Stephanie mentioned between connection, human connection, and the forces of healing, right? I mean, it, it, and, and it probably occurs to us as a matter of sort of common human sense that to the extent that we connect with others, um, we can find healing, right? But, but it's interesting, I mean, to ponder that there are at least at a current count 203 of us gathered here together. Uh, and I, I would uh, like to sort of raise everyone's consciousness that it is more than just 203 of us uh, here with each other, right? It's 203 of us here for each other. And that's in, in part, uh, that change in preposition is in part how the way we are connected connects with the way we can seek healing. So uh, I, I personally uh, and selfishly want to thank all the other 203 of you who are here to help me heal from my own uh, pandemic experiences. And I hope that uh, if nothing is presented here of any value to you, that at least our being together will have helped uh, in some ways. So thank you for that, uh, Stephanie. The other thing I want to take you on in one regard. Uh, you made the statement that uh, people aren't out getting COVID-19 on purpose. And actually, we were getting reports in late summer 
um, when uh, college athletic programs were starting to ramp up that uh, college football uh, players were gathering for COVID-19 parties, uh, thinking that if they uh, got each other all infected with COVID-19 and got over it before uh, the full day practices began, that they would be less likely to end up on the bench during the football season. Uh, so that was a terrifying uh, example of, of uh, it took me back to my days when uh, we used to get our kids together to give each other chip, uh, to give each other chicken pox. Um, but this is obviously a much more frightful uh, virus. So uh, never say never, Stephanie. Um, so before I uh, speak to some of the questions that came up, I wanted to ask Stephanie to comment on a couple of things, because I uh, one of my later slides has some of the uh, I think helpful links that you might want to explore on your own. And one of those was a piece from um, Psychology Today that made some comparisons to uh, military trauma uh, that I think endorses uh, a lot of what uh, Stephanie said. And I think uh, puts that very more hopeful spin on that, uh, that formal research and anecdotal accounts of post-traumatic growth uh, is a common response to combat. And there was at least one study of infantry officers who had just completed combat tours in Iraq and Afghanistan, reported uh, growth in their character strengths of teamwork, the capacity to love, their sense of bravery, their sense of gratitude, their honesty, which is fascinating, that having gone through these experiences, they felt like they grew in, in uh, some of these character traits. Um, they encountered and conquered the greatest challenge of their lives and came out better for it, uh, which is, I think, uh, kind of what Stephanie was saying. Stephanie, do you, do you want to comment on that, or uh, is that simply an endorsement of what you were talking about? I think, I think it's just an endorsement, too. Um, and again, you know, as most good trauma research that we, we use our veterans for it, um, and that's a lot of the brain scans and stuff that I was referencing come from veterans. But yeah, I think that just, again, endorses that further. Great, thank you. And then, uh, so I'm not able, it looks like I'm not able to um, switch the slide. So maybe, uh, okay, this, that's great. This is an, uh, from one of the others that I wanted you to comment on, Stephanie, uh, that uh, places where trauma uh, work is done, uh, there's a lot of focus on acceptance. And I think it's an important point to point out that acceptance doesn't mean being okay with horrible scenarios, right? It doesn't mean being okay or acting through things that are hard and, and assuming that they're easy, right? But it means acknowledging that things aren't well, well, things aren't the way we want them to be. We're going to find ways to live with them and actually uh, thrive. It's interesting that the acronym that you were using is, is uh, comes up with the word thrive, that we're going to thrive uh, in this changed world that we're in, figure out a way to kind of end up above the previous curve, as you showed, which is what post-traumatic growth is. Any uh, comments on that one? Yeah, I just, again, I, I kind of aligned it a little bit with that grief model that that's the ultimate outcome, right? Is that we're going, um, we're going to live through it is going to be part of our story, um, but we're going to be able to identify more the benefits from the story than the losses while acknowledging that obviously there's still going to be loss. There's going to be moments of sadness, but um, the, what is moved forward, you know, general, you talk about developmental evolution. Um, that's, that's the acceptance, right? That like things had to happen in order for us to get, to get stronger as a species and as humans. Um, and it's re been repeated over and over again, that that's what happens. So I think the acceptance side of that also like, re, you know, endorses that hope side of it, that we know that we can get there and that it does happen. So I think that's important too. Thank you. I, I can add to that just a little bit before you move on, Joe. Uh, I've been listening to a podcast called Radio Headspace and uh, they do a lot of little brief meditations. And one of the ones that's really stuck with me throughout this pandemic came from, I think maybe a month ago, where the person doing the podcast talked about resistance and noticing when we're resisting. And when I think about acceptance, I also think about the flip side of that is, you know, we develop all these negative emotions once we start resisting what is reality. And so I've been trying to catch myself resisting whatever the present moment is. And while it's not exactly acceptance, it does help us catch it and, and maybe reframe some of those negative feelings a little bit in that moment, um, which saying very present has been helpful to me. And it just made uh, the thing about acceptance made me think about it. 
That's a very great point. Thank you, Nicole, for sharing that. So, um, so I only have a few slides. What, uh, so the ECHO team was able to share with us uh, some of the comments that um, many of you submitted in advance of this uh, session uh, to kind of share with us what has been on your minds about this whole topic of how to uh, build resilience uh, during this uh, crazy time that we're in. And so um, in an effort to kind of at least speak generally to a few of the recurrent themes that came up, I'm just going to run through a couple of uh, sort of overarching slides and then we'll open up uh, into more of a dialogue. And please, at any point uh, when I'm going through these next few slides, if you have comments or questions, feel free to chime in. If I could, if I could have the next slide. I think it's important, you know, we use the word resilience or resiliency in the title of this session. Uh, and I think it's important for uh, us to at least have somewhat of a common understanding of um, what is meant by the word resilience, right? So, because if you look historically at psychology literature and social science literature, there were suggestions uh, that uh, resilience is either a trait that is something that we all possess, like a, uh, like hardiness, for example, or uh, it's a process such as uh, what you might call adaptation, uh, or it's an outcome, like, for example, building on Stephanie's presentation, an outcome of the absence of post-traumatic stress disorder, right, or evidence of post-traumatic growth as an outcome. And I think it's important to recognize that at least the first and third of these are problematic if we think about resilience as a trait uh, that, that, that would suggest that it's something that either you have or you don't have, which for those of us who might not have it uh, is not really hope inspiring, right? Uh, so the capacity for resilience, it's important to note that the capacity for resilience is in fact inherent in all of us. So to, to understand it as a trait can be problematic. And similarly, to understand it as an outcome also tends to suggest that some of us can get there and some of us can't get there. And again, uh, and also an outcome is simply a point in time. And, what, and so it's where you are at a point in time. And Stephanie wanted to kind of portray what we're talking about here as a process, as a continuous process, as is any growth process, right? So uh, I think uh, that more, um, modern, if you can have the next slide, more modern psychology and social science uh, literature has come to agree upon uh, some version of a definition of, a, of uh, resilience as a process of adapting well in the face of adversity, tragedy, threats, or significant sources of stress. So I think if we could at least agree that, uh, that this is what we're thinking about when we're talking about resilience, it'll at least put us in the same room in the conversation. Right now, I think it's important to point out that, that one could question the use of the qualification of the word well here, right? Because what is well? Uh, who defines what well is? And, and how, how well does one have to be to meet the definition of resilience? But, but I think, uh, I think that, that some of the uh, points that Stephanie made uh, did sort of suggest that it isn't just adapting that we're, we're att attempting to do, right? We're attempting to adapt and grow uh, and get to a better place, which is I think what is implied here by this uh, sense of uh, well. If I could have the next slide, there's, there's been some writing about um, three different sort of categories of what have been called resiliency resources, which I think is, a, is an interesting way to think about this for all of us who are seeking to grow in this uh, process of resilience, right? So there are individual, uh, there's an individual category of resilience. This is, this kind of encapsulates all the things that are inside of me or about who I am that uh, these are personal characteristics or personal skills that I might have. Like if I'm a particularly optimistic person, that might be a resiliency resource for me, my optimism. Or if, if I possess a lot of grit, so my personal characteristics might be uh, individual resources for me. And then skills so that, for example, if, uh, if one develops great mindfulness skills or relaxation skills or, or develops yoga, skills, all of these things have been documented to have 
a beneficial effect on uh, the, uh, a person's sense of positivity, right? And so uh, those are individual things that we can uh, be involved in that if we don't have those skills, there are skills that can be acquired. A second is the sort of community uh, resources. That's related to what we were talking about when we were talking about connection. So how do we, in community with other people, uh, develop social supports, uh, sources of connections. This includes our relationships with family and friends. It includes our working relationships, colleagues. It may include our faith communities, but it's anywhere uh, that where we go in community with other individuals. And then the third, which is a sort of um, less intuitive, but I think perhaps more fascinating as a result, is these uh, existential sources of resiliency, which relate to one's sort of sense of meaning or one sense of purpose in life, which it's interesting uh, if you look at that second instrument that Stephanie shared, there's a lot of questions in there about, I find uh, my life to be meaningful. I think I, I serve a purpose uh, for being here. And so to the extent that we can focus or refocus on our own uh, sense of meaning, and also by the way, grow through this pandemic and find ourselves perhaps better at some things when we come out the other way. Like, are we better at managing our time because we're working from home and we're dealing with multiple stresses in that? Uh, you know, what, what's no longer necessary in my life that felt like it was necessary before I was stressed by this pandemic, uh, right? And, and you know, I, I, I wanna make the case too that when Stephanie talked about reauthoring uh, that really leans a lot toward what uh, the, the folks in narrative medicine uh, or narratology fields talk about when they talk about narrative reconstruction. That sense of reauthoring, how do we reauthor our own stories, uh, leans on uh, this sort of narrative theory that talks about when, when a person experiences a traumatic event or an illness, they become what Arthur Frank, the medical sociologist, describes as narrative wrecks. And so we're experiencing narrative wreckage because the trajectory of our lives was going in a certain direction. We had a sense of knowing where we were going and all of a sudden coronavirus shows up and we're experiencing narrative wreckage. And for those of uh, us on the screen that are caregivers, one of the roles that we can play in entering into a relationship with a suffering person is to work uh, in partnership with that individual to co-construct new narratives, right? This is what we do. Uh, in healthcare is to is to do narrative co-construction, which is another a sort of form of reauthoring. On the existential side of resiliency resources, we all have the opportunity to reconstruct our own personal narratives about what matters to us and what uh, gives us a sense of meaning and purpose in our lives. And so as you think about getting stronger uh, through uh, the stresses of this pandemic, I would urge you to ponder what are your individual resources that you can bring to bear? What are the resources of the communities that you're in that you can bring to bear? And then what are your existential sources that you can bring to bear on this work? Uh, so next slide, lots of questions about um, how should I do this? How should I manage? Uh, what, am I, what am I doing wrong? What could I be doing better? And I, I found a, a fairly interesting piece from the World Health Organization. Uh, that depending on your political stripes, you may have more negative thoughts about the World Health Organization uh, because of you know recent political commentary. But uh, but suffice to say, the World Health Organization has been long respected uh, among the medical profession. And uh, so here are some just quick and and dirty uh, guide guidance uh, points that come to us from the World Health Organization. So one is keep informed and, and informed by trusted sources of, dare we say in this environment we live in, uh, sources of the truth, sources of facts, right? Uh, and so find where you believe the greatest truths reside and seek those sources of information and then stay current, okay? Because this is an ever-changing environment. So attempt to stay current, keeping informed gives you a greater sense of control over what's going on. Second is have a routine, keep to your routine. And if you don't have a routine, make one, create a new routine, right? And, and they go on to say that this includes, try to get out of bed at the same time every day, try to go back to bed every time the same day, try to maintain your same habits of personal hygiene. It's interesting, uh, I, I have a number of buddies and I who have been talking about the fact that 
uh, we notice when we're on Zoom that if we didn't shave today, people probably won't notice. But if we were, if you were seeing us in person, uh, so you know, uh, some of us men have gotten to maybe shaving every two days or every three days. That's probably not a good idea. The goal is to try to stay with your usual habits. Uh, also, eating healthy. Uh, there's good evidence that that we're doing a lot more stress eating, which isn't the healthy kind of eating. So eating healthy, um, exercising or getting up and moving around, making sure that there's both time for work as well as time for rest, uh, and also making sure that there's you know, there's room for the things that you enjoy in life. So what are you doing to have fun? These are questions that we should all be asking ourselves. What are we doing to enjoy ourselves? So that's the routine stuff. Next is uh, minimize news feeds, which is interesting because the first bullet point was keep informed. Well, minimize news feeds <clears throat> gets at get the facts that you need and then get away. Right? I, I, I'm having this problem in my own home right now because my wife uh, doesn't seem to be able to get enough of CNN, which drives me absolutely into my library with the door closed. So, so get the facts and then get away because the problem is that the more information you get, the more it can bear down on you, right? So get the information you need and then don't let journalists or other sources of information um, bear down on you with information overload. Fourth one, and I think this is the most important one, I think it was a shame that we started this pandemic talking about social distancing. I wish we would have never used that phrase. Uh, I've always tried to make the case that we should have been talking about physical distancing while maintaining social contact. All of that in one phrase, not one or the other, uh, but physical distancing, but maintaining social contact. So find ways to stay in contact with the people that you need contact with. And there are ways to do that. Moderating substance use, there's all, all kinds of evidence that we're drinking more alcohol, we're using more illicit substances, we're uh, spending more time uh, on computers and video games. And so there's pretty good evidence that we should be moderating those things. Social media, uh, interestingly, the World Health Organization guidance is to encourage all of us that we should use social media to promote positive stories. And we should use social media to disarm negative stories and, and misinformation. So should we, we should be using our social media to take on misinformation, not to get into fights with people, but to respectfully uh, you know, offer additional information that might be more helpful and promote positive stories. And then uh, the opportunity to help others reach out to people who are in need, uh, supporting healthcare workers, supporting needy members of our of communities, uh, those can also be very helpful. And then the, the, the last of these slides, if you go to the next slide, lots of your uh, questions came about how do I help my kids or how do I help my friend's kids? Uh, how do we keep our children developing? And so these are some of the similar things from World Health Organization, maintaining familiar routines so that they feel like they're structured or create new routines. Uh, I think it's important that we discuss with young people coronavirus in a very honest way, uh, but in an age appropriate term. So we're talking to our four-year-old granddaughter all the time about the germs that are living in the world right now and how, all the things that we're doing to control those germs so that people don't get sick from them. Uh, supporting at-home learning, but also recognizing that since the child is learning at home, there also needs to be time at home for the child to play uh, and, and have fun. Uh, helping to find positive ways for kids to express negative feelings like fear and sadness. So there may be ways to engage uh, kids in play acting or art projects or storytelling projects. Uh, find creative ways to help uh, kids actually express their feelings, talk about them, uh, but in positive ways uh, that actually can in some ways be even, um, if you will, enjoyable. Again, maintaining contact with friends and family members, important for kids to have time with their friends. And since now uh, we can't necessarily have that in person, find ways to have kid gatherings. Uh, I mean, we're all gathering by Zoom. There's a way to get kids together uh, by Zoom. So find ways for kids to be able to connect. Or maybe each day uh, your child gets to call one friend and spend five minutes on the phone talking. Uh, so are there ways to, you know, to connect? Or maybe, maybe we teach our children uh, what I was taught as a kid. How do we write letters and put them in the mailbox to each other? Wouldn't that be interesting? Um, so maintaining contact is really important. Again, moderating screen time, moderating video game time. Uh, doing things in person with, uh, with kids and something creative and interactive that can be, you know, it doesn't have to be art projects, it can be building things, it can be working in the garden, 
uh, all kinds of ways to keep uh, kids in, uh, interactive. And then the last, if you go to the next slide, the last uh, big thing, the word hope comes up in a lot of your questions. How do I find hope in all of this? Or how do I instill it in the people around me who are feeling more hopeless? I found this really cool. Um, I, I wasn't aware of this, but Time Magazine, uh, every, every year Time Magazine does 100, uh, identifies the 100 most influential people in the world and does a, a special uh, uh, edition for that. And this year, 2020, they decided to devote this Time 100 uh, issue to hope in the pandemic. And uh, more than 50% of the top 100 most influential people in the world chose to participate and basically gave commentary about what they do to instill hope in others or to have hope themselves uh, as they're navigating the um, coronavirus pandemic. And I think you'll find that really interesting. I encourage you uh, to check it out. There are people, uh, there are world leaders, there are political leaders, there are people from the entertainment industry, there are uh, uh, sports figures, uh, there are all manner of folks, even the Dalai Lama is uh, included in this. Uh, and so you'll, you'll, uh, you can learn from the voices of at least what one magazine uh, thinks to be fairly influential people in our uh, world. So that's all I wanted to share with you. Uh, there are some links to some of that information on the next uh, few slides, but I'm happy at this point now to open uh, the floor for any questions that you might have for Stephanie on her presentation or any other general questions that you would like to engage in dialogue about at this point in time. Is that okay, Nicole? That's perfect. And we had a couple questions come into the chat um, while you guys were talking. So uh, if Barbara Ozanek, if you'd like to unmute, feel free to unmute and ask your question, or I could read it from the chat box, um, I guess by preference. I was just wondering, um, the two instruments that were in the, in the presentation, are we able to access those? Are they something that's available readily? Do you have to go through, you know, I was just wondering about that. You can you can find them. Um, I believe the post traumatic growth index is free. Um, the well being one they do want you to pay for to, to get the scoring and everything. I mean you can find the questions anywhere. You can put in Google the questions will get. But the actual scoring I'm pretty sure you have to pay. But it was very low price. So but yeah Thank they're they're both accessible. Thank you very much. We also had a question from John Morgan. Oh, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I, I work in a hospital system. And I uh, support staff and I come across staff who are experiencing acute uh, stress reactions due to either traumatic situations they view, with, you know, with family situations or due to this COVID. And I was just uh, wondering about suggestions and uh, supporting the staff who are experiencing um, um, these acute stress reactions in, in my presence normalizing i think that that's the other like no matter what it looks like right like it the stress is normal i think whatever you know uh, we talked nicole talked a little bit about the resistance i even think people that deny the pandemic while not maybe a healthy coping skill i mean that's the very first stage of grief right is that denial and to them that's helpful and so normalizing that they're going through something and then um I think some, and then just being there for them, but then also normalizing support. So if it's out of your purview or, you know, it, it feels, I, I don't know what your relationship is, if you're like a supervisor or something, but if it's, if it's out of your relationship in that one, get, get people directed to help, normalize help, let them know kind of what's out there and stuff like that. But I think normalizing, no matter where you go, um, it, it takes like the bite out of it a little bit. And then it's going to allow people get the, get the help. Yeah, and John, the, the other thing I would add to that is I think if, if you think about the, um, the sort of individual and community and existential sources of resilience, uh, in the, in the uh, healthcare environment, uh, it, every time I see television coverage of what's going on in ICUs and emergency rooms, it's, te it's terrifying. I'm a physician and I've spent time in those sites and it's terrifying for me to watch because the pace seems so high uh, the stress seems so high, the opportunity to take a break seems non-existent. So I think to the extent that uh, you can ensure that at least there are moments, even if they're only brief, where uh, staff have the opportunity to step away from their work and to take a breath and to reflect on the meaning of their work or uh, the meaning of their relationship with you or with others, 
I saw a, a video yesterday of you, uh, some of you may have seen this uh, long time critical care nurse who had worked in a hospital for more than 25 years, perished in the ICU that he had worked in for uh, several decades. And I, and I noticed as part of that uh, video coverage that the staff in that ICU at one point, I don't know whether they were encouraged to do it or if it happened spontaneously, formed a circle and all stood there and held hands. They had gloved hands, gowns, face shields, but stood for a few moments, held hands with their heads down to reflect on what just happened and to reflect on this work that they were doing. Those moments where we can touch each other, even through you know, PPE, uh, or touch each other by, by being present for each other, I think are, are gonna be really important uh, going forward in healthcare environments. And we, we really need to make sure that we're mindful, as Stephanie said, that if someone is struggling to the point of potential you know, catastrophe, we've gotta be there for them. And, and if we're starting to struggle on the brink of catastrophe, we've gotta reach out. So I, I think that would be the other stuff that I would add to that. So we had a question come in from Sherry Adkins who just chatted to me that she has to leave early. So I'm gonna read her question out loud to you. Um, how can employers or institutions foster supportive social contact and debriefing among physicians and other colleagues, healthcare providers during COVID? You wanna take that one, Joe? Sure. Yeah, I can take a stab at that. Again, I think, um, I think in part it relates to what I was just saying in terms of finding uh, there in, in fact, we've been studying and, and reading and writing about this in the, in the context of medical education in general, even without regard to the pandemic, that medical education, the, the, the caregiving experience and the experiences of learning how to care for the sick it can be traumatic. Uh, so there is trauma in the whole medical education process. And so what, what we've been writing about and thinking about a lot is that we need to ensure that as we train healthcare givers, and then as we place healthcare givers in caring environments, that in those environments, we continue to create time and space for reflective work where we can pause and reflect on what just happened uh, and community where we can come together. And, and if nothing else, be present for each other even if it's in a moment of silence or in a room together where we put our heads down and, and all acknowledge how much this sucks, what we're going through, uh, be, because that is, that's a, a, a real source of strength. So there, there need to be spaces and times created for people to exhale and to process these, uh, these poignant and sometimes painful experiences uh, to put them into perspectives. So it's, it's, it's very uncommon, for example, in healthcare environments, and maybe some of you have different experiences, but if, if you look at what medical students and residents report in the literature across the country, how often is it that when a student or a resident experiences the death of a patient they were cared for, caring for and got connected with, where once that person dies, if you're present and you help resuscitate and it was an unsuccessful resuscitation, how often does anyone come up to you pull you aside, put their arm around you or put their hand on your shoulder and say, are you okay? It, it's, it's virtually non-existent. Whereas uh, some more progressive organizations are saying, what just happened was horrific. Let's all come together for a few minutes and just, and just reflect on how horrific it was and how we're gonna hold each other together, how we're gonna hold each other up for the next onslaught of whatever we're experiencing. It's really hard work, but we have to do this with each other. We also have to do this for each other. So that's what I would offer. And I think that's such an important message across all areas of healthcare and social care. We know that there are certain populations that are definitely being impacted uh, disproportionately by the pandemic. You know, so communities of color, impoverished populations, and persons with severe mental illness are all at a very increased risk of both the physical manifestations and additional mental health issues across the board with COVID. And, and just one more thing, I mean, to piggyback on what Ari said, like, we're also all going through this, which I think is kind of like, makes it more complex, right? Of like, especially as providers, like we usually have our, our patients or our clients going through things and then we're able to remove ourselves. We ourselves are patient and clients, right? Like we're all, we're going through this. So that kind of adds that double whammy to it. So um, kind of going what Dr. Zarconi and Nicole are saying is just being aware of others, but also know that like you can't give people water from an empty cup. And so being aware enough to know when you need to step out and you 
need to take a break, like use EAPs, like use time off, like go on vacation days. Obviously you can't go on vacation, but like use those days um, to, to really take care of ourselves and encourage and normalize other people to take time off too. Thank you both. Um, did someone call on Deanna Greer? I hope I pronounced that correctly because I'm great at butchering names. No, it's fine. <laughs> you had put something into the chat and just if you'd like to share a little bit and you know, get some people's feedback. Um, yeah, um, I have a 15 year old daughter and when COVID hit and they closed schools back in March, I didn't realize how much it, it was going to affect her. Um, she's very social. She loves to be with friends and, you know, being at school. And in April, she attempted suicide. Um, she basically just closed herself off. Sorry. <laughs> um, she kind of closed herself off from everybody and we didn't see the signs. She's better to a point. She's not 100%. Um, and it's hard because now I'm back to work in the office. So I'm no longer working from home and she's home by herself all day long because she's still doing the homeschooling part. So it's hard for me to try and, you know, make sure that during the day she's okay, call her if I don't hear from her, should I leave and come home and check on her? Um, but even when she tried to go back to school, which was about September, um, she went for one day and that was it. She had, we had to pull her back and put her into the homeschooling because all the changes that they had to make just to be able to be safe for kids, it wasn't the same for her. She's like, you know, I can't, I can't be with friends. And so it's, it's not just with my daughter. I've seen this with a lot of kids. There's been a lot of kids that the mental part has been really, really tough on them through this all. And I give them credit because they try, you know, they try really hard. Um, but I know like in my county, there isn't, there are mental health services. So I, I've gotten her counseling. Um, but there's like no programs for a teenager that's 15 years old, like a support group. There's nothing here other than just getting her to counseling and, you know, doing stuff like that. It's just, it's been really hard. So I'm, I'm assuming with other parents, it's the same way, you know, not having that support. So, so uh, Deanna, I'm going to ask Stephanie to, to respond initially, but I want to start by uh, acknowledging uh, not just the fact that, I mean, your the story that you shared uh, discussed the suffering of your daughter, but I want to also acknowledge your own suffering and, and, and thank you for sharing that and I and I you know I want you to know that the 194 others of us are sending all of our positive energies both to you and your daughter so and this is this is obviously something that's very particular to you and to your daughter uh, but know that that you know this is an experience that many uh, many of us are having right now in our family so uh, I just see someone in the in the chat saying sending you a virtual hug but I want to acknowledge your <laughs> suffering and let you know that we're with you. Uh, Stephanie, do you want to comment on the specifics? It, that's, I mean, that's what we're seeing. I mean, if you look at statistics and stuff, anybody with even slight underlining um, mental health concerns, this, I mean, it's a disruption of your everyday life. Developing brains, kind of going back to the Bruce Perry thing, developing brains, love routine. Um, Western education is really, really good for routine and telling people what to do and stuff. And there's comfort in that. And that's very, very safe. Um, so you, you ripped away safety blankets of everybody. So developmentally, like it, it makes sense that it happened that way. Um, and so I just, I, I think I just want to say you're such a good mom, you know, for, for doing what you can. Um, if you want to chat offline, I do know Akron Children's has um, partial hosp and um, stuff and it's virtual. So it doesn't matter where you are. So there are virtual support services available um, you know, depending on needs and stuff like that, but feel free to email me or any of the Akron children people that are here and they can help you with that. Okay. Um, so, but yes, but just again, I mean, that's, I think we all need to keep our eyes. Cause again, this looks different, right? Like in, and I think that's kind of the other side of it. Like you said, you didn't see the signs. There probably weren't signs. Like where, where's the, the clinical guidebook on pandemic signs? Like we don't have it yet. So I think granting yourself grace and all that, and then just, you know, a, a encouragement to us to, to check in on our people too. So thanks for sharing. And again, if you need those resources, feel free to 
tag me or where to be on those people. Oh, look at there's tons of people uh, <laughs> throwing in there. So look at resources are coming. You ask and you shall receive. So, but yes, <laughs> yes. And thanks to everybody for sharing that too. Cause that's, I think that's the great thing about this echo too, is that we all have these little tidbits of information. And like, again, this shows the connection and this shows the support. This is a perfect example of why this is good during these, these really strange times. Yeah, and the only, and the only thing, uh, Deanna, that I would add, and I and I too appreciate all of your, uh, and we'll be making the chat available to everyone. But a lot of folks are putting stuff in the in the chat that that you might find helpful and that I'm finding helpful. But I I will if I take my hat, uh, my physician hat off and put my uh, dad hat on. I I think the other dimension of this, which I think you're doing a really nice job of, is um, is staying in conversations with uh, your daughter. Um, and as, as Stephanie said, uh, normalizing, um, you know, how uh, you're feeling and how she's feeling, uh, that uh, I know that you're, you're sad and I want you to know that I'm sad that you're sad and, and let's try to find ways to be sad together and see if we can create solutions to overcome them that, you know, are potentially less harmful to you or to me. Um, and because, because in the final analysis, what has to result at the end of this uh, period that we're living in is that we both need to stay, we need to stay together, we need to hold on to each other tightly um, and find ways for you to hold on to other things that matter to you, like your friends and, uh, you know, the things that uh, make you happy. So uh, just, the, you know, another humble parent uh, throwing in. Nicole, any others? I saw a ton of resources flying in and suggestions and even a couple of good suggestions on things that are just kind of uplifting. Um, it was Carl who had put something in about John Krasinski, who is an actor from The Office, had created the Good News Network, which was quite a bit of fun early in the pandemic. Additional questions, you can put them into the chat or you can unmute and um, share questions, share a story about it, if there's somebody that you're working with or you know, a particular patient or client or you know community that you're working with that you'd like some input on that's what project echo is for is for us to all continue to help one another and support one another so what other questions comments or, or feedback are folks looking for i just wanted to capitalize on you know the recommendations for something like um a, you know, the, the great program that Akron Children's has with partial hospitalization, it, it really does well in connecting children who are hurting um, with others. And it, it, there's a lot of power to that. The, the second thing is um, really establishing, um, even though the routine of school has been mixed up and not there and, you know, what that expectation is, you can still establish um, routine in the household. Um, so that, you know, that means just like, you get up at the same time, you don't sleep in, you know, you get up as you would and you do these things and it may take a little extra work to designate that social time or something new. Um, it can be really helpful for a child that's just been abruptly pulled from, from a school district. The, the, the third thing that I want to say is never underestimate, like just capitalizing on what Joe was saying, never underestimate the power of family. I think all too much we don't give ourselves credit as as parents because we think we're the outsiders um, and that you know what our children don't have accessible to them is a is a big giant hole. But having been through um, some challenges with with my own children and recognizing that there is a, a, the power of a loving family to know that someone unconditionally loves um, loves you is 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 sometimes more than what maybe other kids don't have in, in their lives. And so I think we often take advantage of that when we're looking to, to make things better and to do things better for, for our families and our children. So that just applies for everybody. We, you know, it's really taking a look at all these really great things that, that come into play in the resources that, that um, come about. And, and Deanna, I also wanna just, say to add emphasis to what everyone has said is that I, because I had a, a, a kid that struggled uh, mightily during his teenage years and I'll never forget, uh, there was a moment when I was fearful about his risk of suicide and, and depression and he, uh, at a time when um, someone that we both knew uh, took their own life, 
uh, he came to me and we had a very painful conversation about that. But uh, there was a moment in that conversation where he said something to me that I thought was so profound and I never forgot. He said, Dad, I think I honestly think that if we can make sure that we keep talking to each other, I'll, I'll find it easier to hold on. Uh, so we keep we can never stop talking to each other. And I think that's kind of what uh, Dr. Duval was referring to in terms of don't underestimate your power as uh, someone your daughter loves dearly. Yeah, that's that's actually something that my husband and I both do with her on a daily basis. We, we talk about how she's feeling today. Um, my husband will sometimes ask her, you know, can you name like five positive things that happened today? And then we kind of discuss those together. Um, like I said, she's she's definitely come a long way, but it's she's not she's not 100 percent. And I just I think with with all this that's gone on, it's just it's been really hard. And I've seen it with other students that she goes to school with as well. You know, so it's not it's not just her. I just, you know, hopefully everything at some point will go back to the way it used to be. And you know, but I do I do appreciate all the support. I'm right. I'm trying to write down everything that everybody's saying throughout the the chat box here, and I'm like trying to find everything. <laughs> we will absolutely capture all of the the resources and links from the chat and share those um, with participants after the session. And I'm going to call on Lori Nock if her audio works. Who has it? Yes. Suggestion. Yes, yeah, so I was thinking, you know, Dr. Zarconi mentioned writing letters. So I thought if Deanna, if you wouldn't mind giving us your address as, as a group of healthcare providers, we could rally around your daughter and send her a letter of encouragement. Um, I'd be willing to do that. <laughs> I think everybody would too, you know. So thank you. Thank you for the suggestion, Lori. I think it's a lovely idea and Deanna, if that's not something you would like to share publicly, we could also figure out another way to, to get those letters over to you if people wanted to send them to Neomed. No, and that, that, that's perfectly fine. I don't have a problem with that. All right. Maybe the chat box would be a good place for that so that you know, it doesn't show up on the video recording. Um, so we certainly don't video record the chat box. Hi, um, my name is Juanita McRoberts, um, and I just wanted to share a couple things um, from like a peer support standpoint. Um, I think like the first thing, while you know we want people to be resilient, we also also have to be mindful. Like in the midst of trauma, recovery and resilience is such hard work. So just kind of taking things day by day, and like encouraging people to listen to their body without judgment can go so far. Cause I think sometimes when people hear these ideas and they can't do it, or they're not like able yet, um, they may feel overwhelmed. Um, but, you know, making this information available is con completely life-changing and very helpful. Um, and so also, you know, I've heard people say it before, but really experiencing those core feelings and honoring them and being able to sit with them. Personally, there's been several times during the pandemic where I just had to like just cry and like me and my friends say like, you just have to go fetal, like infant like almost. Um, and sometimes it's scary um, to experience that, especially someone with mental health, um, because, you know, it's always that looming fear, like, is this going to be like a set off moment? Is this going to be something that triggers me? Um, so creating safe spaces for those. Um, for youth, um, there's two things I'm really thinking about. Number one, asking them how they want to be supported. Um, it's so transformative, you know, like, and if they say, well, I don't know, how do you not like to be supported? Let's start with that. Um, and when things feel out of control, right, people want to do something to control. And unfortunately, sometimes that's where suicidal ideation comes up. So, you know what I mean? Just giving them maybe a small task a day that makes them feel like they accomplished something like, okay, like no matter what, I did this today. Um, and then the last thing is check in on solo people, especially I'm talking to people in healthcare providers. If you are providing these services right now and you are, you know, working from home by yourself and you only have your cat that you got during quarantine, <laughs> you deserve support. Um, so just make sure you reach out to people. And if you know someone is at home like by themselves, reach out to them because 
for everyone choosing safety over tradition is super hard but it's it's a little bit you know more tolerable when you have another human being there thank you so much so I can't I can't resist the urge to respond to what you just said, uh, Carnita. First of all, thank you. Um, second of all, I think it would benefit all of us uh, to go back to this recorded session and play uh, the segment that was spoken by Carnita over and over and over again. You you said some really important things, but there are a couple that I wanted to comment on. One is in the first one that you uh, started with, which I think is really important for all of us to remember. This the whole con there's been pushback on this whole concept of resilience uh, that, that relates to what you were talking about when you first started speaking, right? And, and that is the sense that when we talk about resilience, there's this sort of subconscious um, assumption that if I can't be resilient, there's something wrong with me, right? That this is some sort of, some sort of personal failure, when in fact, uh, it, it's, it's not a problem with me, it's a problem with the world around me. And, all, and, and so I just need to continue to grow through what's going on in the world. So, so I, th I thank you for uh, pointing that out because if we talk too much about, you know, you need to be resilient or, or we, I want that, it, it sort of implies that, that the problem is inside of us as, a, as opposed to the problem is all around us. Uh, and so, and then I love the going fetal uh, concept. I, I absolutely love that because I think what happens uh, to, and this is very common for healthcare givers and probably uh, social care givers as well, that uh, when we have these very strongly emotional experiences, if you, uh, on, the, on that night that you said you needed to sit and cry, if you didn't cry at that point, if you just shoved it under the rug, put it away, um, the next time you, you get to that point, you'll feel the need to cry maybe a little less intensely. And if you put it away then, the next time you need to cry, you'll feel a little less intensely. And pretty soon, guess what? You're not feeling it anymore and you begin to lose the feeling, emotional part of who you are. And we all need our emotional selves to be caring human beings for ourselves and for others. So I really appreciate you saying that don't just clam up and, and remain silent, find space and time to blather on, go fetal, snot, snot and slobber all over yourself if you need to. Uh, and if you can have somebody join you for that, that's fine. If you need to do it alone, I really appreciate uh, your comments. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Zokani. And just picking back on that, I think that, again, I think that's so important. And just, again, that like, this is a journey and everybody's journey is gonna look different. And I, I love that, like, let's honor everybody's journey. Um, and be there for them. And I, I, again, I just appreciate and you, you can tell you're very good at your job. So thank you for sharing. Thank you, Stephanie. <laughs> we continue to get lots of really good suggestions and you know, offerings in the chat box. People feel free to unmute and share. Um, Juanita, thank you so much. I agree uh, with Joe, we need to go back and rewatch what you said several times. And to those who are wondering within, I, I promise by the end of the week, well, I shouldn't promise, but I, I know one of our coordinators will promise to get the recording of this online on our YouTube page, which there is a link from the main project echo page um, by the end of the week. So yes, there will be the recording and you'll get a copy of the slides as well. I, I, just, I would just like, I okay. would just like to say, I would just like to say something here. Um, I, I've been listening, and unfortunately, I can't uh, join you guys through video, um, but I really appreciate all, everything that was said, because it, it put my mind into um, thinking about other things. You know, I don't work. I work in the mental health addictions. I work with uh, individuals who have gotten out of prison with, like, community linkage, treatment linkage. So I'm not in a hospital or a nursing home, and I don't see the effects firsthand that COVID has, especially doing telehealth right now. I don't even, I haven't even met half of my clients. It's just over the phone. <clears throat> but I do have friends um, who, uh, you know, the father is uh, higher up in the hospital and everything like that. And it, you know, it causes me to think of what all they've been through and um, after this training session is done, I'm going to um, 
once we get the recorded up online, I'm going to forward that to him because I think that would be a great help to him and his family. So again, uh, I thank you. And thank you for sharing that, Paula. And, and I, I want to remind everyone that even if we don't work in a hospital system, those working with community mental health um, in particular, we know that people with severe mental illness are impacted by this virus more seriously because of comorbid health conditions. We also know that one in five people who have gotten COVID end up with either worsening of mental health symptoms or a new mental health diagnosis. So we are all in a different space of dealing with COVID. And maybe some of those, you know, maybe some people are working in intensive care, but others of us are, are working in much different environments with equally intense kinds of symptoms. Um, so thank you. Um, Nicole, I wanted to, uh, I've, I've been thinking a lot about this lately, uh, and I wanted to make another comment uh, that gets at uh, context for this pandemic a little bit. And uh, because I think it's interesting, and I and I was just reading a piece uh, the other day where uh, someone was uh, helping me become more aware of the fact that the timing of this pandemic, uh, the, the timing of when it began to blossom, uh, at least here uh, for us here in the United States, um, made a difference too, right? It was it was in some ways as a nation uh, an experience of being kicked when we were down a little bit, and by that I think. What I mean is that uh, you could argue that we as a nation have never been a more divided sort of country. And so uh, we, we have really kind of come apart from each other in a lot of ways, politically and socially. Uh, I think uh, that, uh, that the current political environment has made that worse. So there's that uh, problem. Uh, the second is that we, I believe, have regressed in so many ways with respect to racial uh, justice and equity in our country. And so uh, we, that is another way in which we've become uh, separated from one another or isolated from one another. And, and at a moment in time where we were, are struggling as a nation with how to find ways to reconnect with each other or to connect better with each other, we, um, we had this pandemic foisted upon us that required us to all go to our rooms and close the doors. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and so, and, and what's, what, what I've been reflecting on recently is that the work that needs to be done to get us out of this pandemic mess is in some ways similar to the work that needs to be done to get out of this racial inequity mess and this political division mess, right? And that is, how do we find ways to have the conversations differently? And how do we change the conversations? How do we, you know, elevate the need to come together above the need to defend our own positions? Uh, and and I think uh, I think just as we're trying to find ways to reconnect with each other when we can't be in the same building with each other, uh, we've got to continue to do the work of finding ways to reconnect with each other when we can't seem to find commonality in our views, uh, or we can't seem to fully appreciate the lived experience of someone who's wholly other than our Selves, right, or who have experiences that we can't begin to imagine. So I just I, I I put that out there because I think it's important that since we're all gathered to reflect on how can we overcome, I think a part of overcoming the pandemic can help us overcome some of these other uh, crises that uh, we're facing together as well. So I, ju I just wanted to mention that. Thank you, Joe. I know at some point I saw Stephanie unmuted and, and uh, Jennifer Dougal, so I don't know if either one of you want to jump back in. I was just gonna I was just gonna say a, a thankful thankful funny as we're sitting here. My post traumatic growth is I can begin to smell today. As we've been sitting through this session, I am now regaining a modicum of taste and smell from my COVID <laughs> post postmortem. So thank you all for your beauty, beautiful, uh, beautiful support and the kind words because it brought a healing process you didn't even know was existing. So there is hope. Thank you, Jennifer. I still cannot smell or taste anything. It's been weeks. I have a massive headache. Um, I do family and parent peer support, 
And I actually took from COVID um, isolation. I have mental illness myself. It was very hard. So now when I hear other people, I can, um, I know what it's like to be isolated. And I reached out via uh, Zoom meetings, uh, FaceTime with my family, like videos on, fa on Facebook, the video chat. That was very important and what kept me out of that. So I take the positive out of having COVID and being isolated that I can share that with others. And I am actually the ones that, um, that I peer that have been in isolation or, or they have to stay home. I, I try to do the video as much as possible because seeing somebody is very important. Um, it was very important to me so I can take that to others. Yes, some of them still just like to text or phone call or say, well, I'm in quarantine. I can't talk to you for 10 days, 14 days. I still try to do the reach out, you know, because I know how important it is. I did sit on my front porch in the sun one day and cry. I made myself do it on the front porch, not in my bedroom in a dark room. So, so it is, um, I, I took the positive. I wasn't super sick. I've had some close to me that's been super sick, hospitalized. I've had many, you know, affects everybody different, but, but there is, po I mean, I, I try to take the positive out of the COVID and I can share this with others and hopefully get others through this. Um, this pandemic that we're in one person at a time because it's going to be a while and I still can't smell or taste and have severe headaches and it's been like four weeks so maybe eventually that's my you know Jennifer maybe maybe later today I can smell or taste something that would be great <laughs> I, I've been, Rhonda I've been doing smell training <laughs> I read a, a Harvard article and so I have my uh, essential oils um, that I've been sniffing probably probably my nose is like, what the heck are you doing? <laughs> but they say that you can regenerate your, <laughs> your connectors <laughs> there. So <laughs> I sniff I'm some cloves. Look into it. <laughs> I don't recommend the cloves because you might inhale them and not know it. <laughs> I, I, I keep going to the garlic powder. If I can't smell that, I can't smell that. <laughs> and I'll, and I'll say two things to you, Rhonda, at least from the evidence that we have available to us in general, those uh, functions uh, do fully recover. There is a variability in the time that it takes. Uh, the other is that it may be a, a, a good time for all of us in our personal lives to reflect on, um, are there any benefits to not being able to smell things uh, as we uh, interact with our family members and other things? I'll just leave it at that. I can clean the cat litter, that was a positive. <laughs> Our mouse cage didn't get clean for quite a while because no one knew that it was a problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so not related to smells, but <laughs> see, it's like bad timing on this. Uh, but, but just going back to kind of what Joe said about like each our individual. Um, I just listened to a wonderful podcast about that whole like what you resist persists kind of things. Um, and the whole idea was instead of telling people how they're wrong or trying to convince them the other way, put your energy into what you're doing to make things better. And I just even think everybody's sharing their stories here. You're just putting what has worked for you out into the environment. And that's, that's how we're going to get over this, you know, instead of beating our heads against the things that aren't working, um, moving forward. And, and we talk about that with, with racial injustice, with political, um, instead of telling people they're wrong, um, let's focus on what, what we feel is right and putting our energy to that and seeing that move that dial. Um, and there's a lot of kind of research into that too. And I think that can, that can, I mean, this right here, you guys are, are doing the work. So um, I think this is a good example of that. And Stephanie is an example of what, re, what we resist persists. I, I, I think the second most common uh, whining that we're all doing, uh, second only to I'm done, so done with this pandemic, is I'm so done with Zoom, right? But, but, I, but let's pause and reflect for a second on, because uh, I see a lot of heads nodding when I said I'm so done with Zoom. But could you imagine what, this, what would have been like for all of us if Zoom didn't exist uh, where we would be right now? And, and I'm, I, I'm sick of Zoom meetings too, but I got to tell you, you know, I have a son in DC and I have a son in San Diego. We've had two and a half hour dinners together uh, on Zoom. We had a five hour cookathon where we all made lasagna in our in five different families' houses, where we all made lasagna and then cooked it. Had a uh, had a little bit of a cocktail hour during uh, the cooking of it, which we're not supposed to be, you know, advertising. And then ate together. I mean, there's so many things. 
uh, Sunday, my wife and I watched the Browns game with both of our sons in three different cities uh, by Zoom. So, uh, so there. So again, find ways to take what we're sick of and use it to, you know, to our advantage. And as a shameless plug for all of our other Echo programs, we have a, a number of weekly Echo programs and a couple monthly Echo programs and. We try to encourage cameras on because Rhonda, you're right. There's something about that facial connection and being able to read people's body language that makes you feel like you're in the same room with them. And that has been definitely very therapeutic for me to spend my Fridays at noon with the same community of folks, um, some of which I think are on the call today. And you know, as many other echoes as I can get on because AES, CME, CEUs, but really that community and being able to stay connected to people and continue to have conversations and continue to feel supported and to support one another has been huge. We have five minutes left. Um, there is a link in the chat box for some feedback if you'd like to share some feedback with us. And remember the EADS code is 70 more M-O-R-E, morning, Oscar, Roomba, Echo. But we do have five minutes, so if anybody has some last thoughts, questions, comments, uh, anything for the good of the order, this has been a fantastic conversation. I'm so happy and honored to spend the last 90 minutes with all of you. Yeah, I will, too, add my thanks for this communion with all of you. And thanks once again to both Stephanie and Joe for putting together a great presentation and to everyone for sharing and all of the just outpouring of support for one another and suggestions. Um, we will definitely collect all of those links and try to get those together. And I, for one, am, am going to join the letter writing campaign for Deanna's daughter. Question in the chat box, is there a newsletter to monitor Neomed activities? Uh, not yet, not the, specifically the Echo ones, but that's something that we have talked about putting together is a Neomed Echo newsletter, but you can always double check our website and we try to keep that as up to date as possible. I don't know if anyone else, if, if anyone else on the team would like to speak to other possible newsletters that could go out. Or ways to stay connected. Well, you brought newsletter back up to the top of my list. Well, if there's no last thoughts or comments, thank you everyone for your day. Have a wonderful day. I hope to see you in one of our regular echo sessions. Please do visit us again. Take care of yourselves and one another. Thank you. And as people sign off, I'll end with the final note. I did know.